Hello out there in Radio Land. This is Michael. This is Street Preacher's Corner Podcast, the podcast that proves that anyone can have a podcast. Well, I'll tell you, the, uh, the subject today is uh, a little difficult for me, but uh, as you can tell by the title, we're going to talk about Peter S. Ruckman, and uh, it's complicated. So I really struggle the best way to lay this out. Like right towards the, the, the beginning of this podcast, I had done one, an episode called The Complicated Legacy of Jack Howells. And, and that, that came about because I was reading a book about a guy who was heavily influenced by Howells. And I really enjoyed the book. And, and I was already familiar with Howells. Um, so I did. I, I did this one called The Complicated Legacy of Jack Howells. And it has been a perennial favorite. I think it is probably the one that has gotten the most uh, views or whatever you call them, and also the most comments. Um, but I never had the emotional attachment to Jack Howells that I did or, or that I do, present tense, to Peter S. Ruckman. So let's, let's start there. Let's start with my part in all this, my attachment to this fellow. So when we talk about Ruckman's legacy... I have to include myself in all that. Uh, when I say way back in April of 1995, Peter S. Reutemann was probably the first hero I ever had as a Christian. Uh, when I was lost, all my heroes were gangsters and matchstick men. It's a con man if you don't know the parlance there. Uh, but here was a guy, a preacher uh, that I understood. I, the way I was introduced to Doc, and that's the term I'll use, <laughs> over and over again to refer to him. It is, it is a term of endearment. Um, the way I was introduced to, to Doc um, was that the church where I got saved at, uh, El, uh, Lighthouse Baptist Church in San Diego, had a military ministry, and the, the way that worked is they would bring guys off the base, and they would take them to church, and then you know preach to them, and then feed them a home-cooked meal. The ministry at that time was run by uh, a guy named Alex Rogers. It was run out of his house. Uh, we'd eat has, at his house. There was a little side room, a little um, um, uh, a little sort of side bedroom, kind of like a converted garage, had some bunk beds in it, and if you were a sailor and you were part of them and you were, you were all that stuff going on, you could stay there, and I stayed there many, many a nights. Well, that guy, Alex Rogers, at his house, uh, so he, you know, we would stay at his house sometimes between church services. Sometimes if you wanted to go back to the base, he would take you. If you wanted to stay, he would let you stay. So one day, a bunch of us squids are sitting around Alex's house uh, in between church services, and um, Alex said he had something he wanted to show us. He wanted something he wanted to see, and it was it was a preacher. And uh, Alex prefaced it by saying, "Some of you guys won't be able to handle this." And so he puts in this VHS. This is how old I am. A VHS. He put in a VHS uh, of a, a tape of Doctor Roman preaching a message called "Hypocrites in the Church." And for the next half hour or so, I watched this man draw and preach. And I also watched one sailor after another get up and leave. And when that tape ended, I was the only one sitting there. And I'd fall in love with the guy. I'd fall in love with Dr. Ruckman right from the beginning. I liked Ruckman because he talked like me. I say, well, that's not a very good spiritual reason. Okay, fine. It's not. What do you want me to do? Ed, stand on my head? <clears throat> but as time went on, I found out that not everybody liked him. In fact, so, um, he was, uh, in the words of one man that uh, that I know, uh, he said, Peter Ruckman is the most controversial and polarizing man in fundamentalism, which is really saying a lot because there's a lot of uh, uh, people like that. So I only met Doc a handful of times, and, and maybe I'll talk about it, but that maybe not. Not every story uh, needs to be told. Uh, not every story deserves to be told. But I will say this. Uh, the, the old man affected my life for the better in one, in lots of ways, but in one particular, very specific way. He made the case that the individual words in the Bible that I had in my hand could be trusted. And that assurance has been the foundation for so much of what I've done in the ministry. I come before you today with full confidence in the Bible that I have in my hand and that has helped with boldness, that has helped with assurance, that has helped with so many things. I don't have to run to the Greek, I don't have to run to the Hebrew, I don't have to worry about what the originals say. I have what God wants me to have in a language that I read and understand. And not just, you know, the close approximation of the best English translation. I have the actual words that God wants me to have. 
I learned that. That was established in my heart and in my mind um, through the ministry of Pete Ruckman. And so you can take that for what it's, what, what it's worth. That, like I said, that, that has positively impacted me uh, more than you could ever know. But hey, it is still complicated. So I'm going to read to you excerpts from Doc's obituary. Now, obituaries are a funny thing. Um, sometimes I'll read obituaries, as, as Groucho Marx used to say. The first thing in the morning is I, when I get up in the morning, I uh, read the obituary page. If my name's not on there, then I get out of bed. Most of the time, obituaries are not written by the deceased. And I've always felt like obituaries are a good window into what other people, what somebody else thinks is important about you. What other people think of when they think of you. That's what winds up in your obituary. Not what you are, necessarily, but what they think you are. Okay, so here we go. Peter Sturgis Ruckman was born physically on November 19, 1921, to John and Mary Ruckman in Wilmington, Delaware. At a young age, the family moved to Topeka, Kansas, where he grew up while going back to Wilmington during the summertime. He had a brother, Johnny, and a sister, Marion. Coming from a long line of military men, he followed in their footsteps by enlisting in the Army and served in World War II as a DI in hand-to-hand -hand combat in the Philippines and spent time in Japan monitoring the radio broadcasts at Radio Tokyo. But at the age of 27 years old, he enlisted in a different army, a spiritual army. On March 14, 1949, Dr. Ruckman served up, signed up in the Lord's Army by accepting Jesus Christ as his personal Savior at the radio station in Pensacola, Florida. He was led to the Lord by a Baptist preacher, Brother Hugh Pyle. At one time, he wanted to be a 30-year man and retire from the Army. He now has done over two 30-year hitches in the Lord's Army, the right Army. Throughout the 67 years he has served the Lord, his vision and his burden was to reach lost souls for Jesus Christ and to teach people that we have a Bible that is perfect and infallible that you could hold in your hands, the authorized King James 1611 version. He had a burden, especially to reach young men for Christ, to get them rooted and grounded in the Word of God so they would be equipped to defend the book against the agnostic scholars who try to rob you of your faith in the King James Bible. From this desire, Pensacola Bible Institute was started. It continues today from Dr. Ruckman prayerfully and wisely choosing a man, Brian Donovan, to train and equip to carry on the work of the school and the church after he has gone on to glory. Dr. Ruckman has pastored for well over 50 years, including a church in Bayman, Alabama, Brent Baptist Church, and Bible Baptist Church in Pensacola since 1973. He was also the founder and president of Pensacola Bible Institute, which was started in September of 1965. Dr. Ruttman was a man of many talents. He was a preacher, a teacher, a street preacher, an artist, a writer. He played the tube and the harmonica. Uh, he'd studied the Oriental religions, so martial arts, taekwondo, and aikido, and started playing hockey as a goalie at 68 years old, with his last game being on his 84th birthday. Uh, let me hit the pause button here. The reason he quit playing hockey was the church's insurance would no longer cover him. It wasn't because he was too old to do it. Just if he was getting busted up pretty good and, and the health insurance wouldn't cover him anymore. Anyway, that's a little inside baseball there. He played. He also played racquetball, enjoyed mullet fishing, and was avid reader, liked to garden, and had a small truck farm, as he called it, and was still swimming laps with a snorkel at 93. He had a profound knowledge of the scripture and its correlation with history. God gave him a special gift to be able to tie in world events and history to the Bible. And then, of course, he dearly loved kids and dogs, especially German shepherds. He loved to have them run around all over the place. He loved to see them play and laugh. His special treat was to give uh, to give the kids gummy bears at each service. And if he ran out, he would give them strawberry Twizzlers or chocolate. One of the things dearest to Dr. Hartman's heart was his burden and love for doing the prison ministry. He looked forward to each time he had an opportunity to go into the jails and minister to the men and women there, especially... The yearly two-week-long summer junkets. This, that was his Christmas. Words cannot express the appreciation and gratitude for all the love, support, friendship, and prayers of so many saints throughout all the years, some for many years and some for just a few. Though many dangers, toils, and snares, he has already come. After a fall in 2015 and many months of declining health, he is now at home with his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God gave him a full cup. Well, that's something, right? I mean, he's not just a soldier. He's the son of a soldier. He's the grandson of an old soldier. He is a man who uh, spent his early adulthood in a war zone teaching men how to kill each other with their bare hands. 
Uh, he's a singularly talented man, in many ways, a tragically flawed man. He's a, a forceful personality. He was a brilliant mind. And yet he was a personality uh, that was unimpressed by formality or, or pompousness or pomposity. Uh, I mean, he could have been a great intellectual. He could have been a, a highly esteemed professor type fellow, but he preferred the company of common people. And in his almost seven decades of ministry, uh, Dr. Ruckman preached easily tens of thousands of times in, in churches and tent revivals and home church groups, homeless shelters, hospitals, jail cells. He was on television. He was on the radio. He was on the street. He founded a Bible Institute where most of the curriculum was devised from his own personal Bible study. And uh, towards the end of his life, he compiled probably the strangest reference Bible you'll ever come across. Once again, he compiled the reference Bible from his own notes. Uh, he wrote, I don't even know how many books and, and, and pamphlets and on every conceivable doctrine and topic. And he said a lot of things. And some of the things which he said are timeless. And some of which he said was ill-advised. And some of which the things he said was just plain stupid. And sometimes he was just joking. Any man who talks that much and for that long is bound to say goofy things, especially when your speaking style is so, you know, extemporaneous. Now, that's not an excuse for, for, for dumb things, but it is, it is part of the equation when you start factoring this man's life. Critics who want to find something to hang over his head literally have millions of words, both spoken and, and written, to sift through. It, it is all there. The good, the bad, the ugly, the out of context. But that by itself, is not what makes Peter S. Ruckman such a complicated person to talk about. Easy to dismiss, but hard to talk about. Okay, so let's get, let's, 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 let's go dip below the tree line here. Let's talk about Dr. Ruckman's home life. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 3, a bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man not know how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the house of God? That's what the Bible says. The Bible that Dr. Ruttman taught me to love says that. So now I'm going to quote from the man himself. This is a quote from The Last Grenade, which is a book he wrote in 1990. Uh, here's the quote. I have had two wives desert me after 15 years of marriage. I have been in court custody cases where seven children's futures were held in the balance. In situations where gospel articles were being torn out of typewriters, biblical artwork torn off the easels, women trying to throw themselves out of cars at 50 miles per hour, mailing wedding rings back in the middle of revival circus, uh, services, cutting their wrists, threatening to leave if I did not give the church, my church to their kinfolk, deacons threatening to burn down my house and beat me up, children split custody between two domiciles 200 miles apart, and knock down drag out arguments in the house, sometimes running as long as three days. Now keep in mind, Dr. Ruttman never made a secret of any of this. What I just read you is what he voluntarily told. His first wife deserted him, and by his own testimony, which is on record, uh, it was because of what a horrible person he was before he was saved. That even though he was saved, the damage was already done, and, and, and she just couldn't, she couldn't hang. The second wife deserted him after infidelity and sheer craziness on her part, at least to hear him tell the story. The third wife, the only one I ever met, uh, stayed with him for 27 years, I think, until the day he died. So, what are you going to do with that? Well, some of his critics will run to 1 Timothy 3, what I just read you, and say, look, husband of one wife, husband of one wife, he was married three times. Now, I, I, they'll take issue with that. Now, I personally think that 1 Timothy 3, when it says husband of one wife, is a reference to polygamy. L let, me, let me explain. L let, me, let me back up a little bit here. So, once upon a time, uh, Dr. Ruttman was was a uh, pastor of Brent Baptist Church in Pensacola. And if, if you know the story better than I do, and, and I, I messed it up the details, I'm, I apologize in advance, but this is how I remember the story being told. 
And um, the head of his old alumni, uh, uh, Bob Jones University, Bob Jones the second called him up and said, so this time his his uh, his wife had left him, and uh, the first wife had left him, and he was pastor in the church. And Bob Jones the second called up and said, hey, you can't be the pastor of the church. You need to be married. You have to have a wife, the husband of one wife. You have to be a husband to be the pastor. And Brother Ruckman said, okay, fine, I'll go get married. And, and Bob Jones said, no, no, then you'll have two wives. And Dr. Ruckman said, well, how many do I have now? Well, you have none because you're not married because you're single. And Doc said, well, if I have none, if I have zero now and I go get one, how does zero plus one equal two? See? So, fine. If you want to say that 1 Timothy 3 is it means a man can only be married once, I can respect that opinion. We disagree on it. Um, either way, I think the thorny part of 1 Timothy 3, when it comes to Dr. Ruckman, is earlier in the passage. Everybody zeroes in on the husband of one wife part, but there's a that's not the beginning of the sentence. That's, even, that's not even the first qualifier laid out. The first qualifier laid out is that a man be blameless. And um, I think it's unreasonable. Character of the women notwithstanding. Let's say his second wife was hell on wheels. Maybe she was, maybe she wasn't. I have no idea. But it, it, I, don't, I think it's unreasonable for a man to have two different women desert him without at least being partially to blame. Because after all, the only thing those women have in common is him. My dad's been married nine times. And the only thing all those women have in common is him. So, so I think it's, I think it's unreasonable to say, oh yeah, well, uh, it was totally their fault both times. Eh. I mean, really, really. I mean, I live with me. I have a wife. I, I know how. I know. I know. I know how the sausage is made. You know. So, how much is he to blame? How much do they to blame? I have. I personally have no idea. I don't even pretend to know. I think, though, I think a solid scriptural argument uh, could be made, and probably should have been made. That my hero, Dr. Peter S. Ruckman, was qualified to teach the Bible. He was qualified to be on TV. He was qualified to be on radio. He's qualified to write books and articles. I think you could say he's even qualified to found a Bible Institute. But he was, at various points in his life, not qualified to be a pastor. I know in some people's minds that is the end of the world, that the pastor of a church is what you aspire to. The pastor of the church is the is the top rung on the ladder that unless you're the pastor or anything else you're doing doesn't count. But I just I just went down the road ten miles one way, uh just an hour before I started this, and preached on a street corner uh to thousands of people that were coming by for a festival in the town ten miles down the road from me. And that's a great work, and I'm not a pastor of a church. I preach thousands of times to tens of thousands of people, and it's a great work. I've written books. I've, written, I've done podcasts. I've done all this stuff. You can do a lot of stuff without being a pastor. But because pastor is, an, is a position of honor, and it is, a lot of people think that unless you're a pastor, and I'm sure it opens up doors to you, because it shows that other people have confidence in you. But he could have done all those things without being a pastor, I guess is, is, is my point. Um, whatever point that is. And I also don't think, maybe you could disagree with me about this, I don't think a disqualification from being a pastor is permanent. Let's say, you know, one of the, one of the qualifications for being a pastor is that you be hospitable or given to hospitality is the phrase. And so if you were not naturally hospitable, but you learned to be hospitable, then you are now qualified where you were not qualified before. Any man at any point in his life will have occasional periods where he does not display all the qualities of 1 Timothy 3. So I believe 1 Timothy 3 is a statement about the overall pattern of that man's life. And if a man addresses the problems in his life and addresses them publicly enough and long enough to prove himself and to get the confidence of other people, other believers, I see no scriptural prohibition against him resuming uh, in a leadership capacity. But I also wouldn't fault somebody who'd never had confidence in that man again. 
So if you've seen a pastor mess up and you feel like he's permanently out of the race, I can respect your opinion. And depending on the situation, I might even agree with you. But my point is that family troubles are a big deal when evaluating Ruckman's ministry. And those of us that loved him have to be honest enough to admit that. Now, Doc's critics, uh, and there are plenty of them, uh, they will take issue with Doc's language. They will say, he was, I mean, he was a rough character. He was, he was a rough character. He was an old soldier, and he talked like it, and that's just how that is. Here, I have another quote. Okay, this is from Doc himself. This is a quote from, uh, I don't know where I got this from. I think it's from the book, The White Throne Judgment. If I had one fault, it has been in being much too to the point, too direct, too thorough, too concentrated, too vulgar, and too specific in making charges. I know I am no example. I am one of the crudest fellows you ever met in your life. They have been trying to refine me for 40 years, and I am worse now than I was 10 years ago. As much as I love the man, and I do, and I did, that's a problem. He says, I know I am no example. Unfortunately, that's what the Bible required him to be as a pastor. It required him to be an example. And so those of us that loved him cannot make excuses for him that he would never have made for himself. More about that later. Well, let's circle back to the language. So the Bible says uh, in 1 Timothy 6, starting in verse 3, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof coming cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. Perverse disputings of men with corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw themselves, or with some, from such withdraw thyself. I don't know why I can't read today. I promise you I was taught. But anyway, Rutland's critics will, will, will go to that verse in 1 Timothy 6, and they will say, well, look, you know, what he was saying weren't wholesome words. Well, let's define wholesome. Wholesome words is defined in the verse. It says, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So a, a man uh, that is speaking on God's behalf should speak the way God spoke when God was a man. Okay? So let's look at some words of Jesus Christ. We're going to be in Matthew 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but within are full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Because ye build the tombs of the prophets, and garner the sepulchres of the righteous, and say, If we had been in the days of our fathers, we have not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore ye be witness unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send to you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them ye shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, the son of Barachus, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Very lastly, and you all things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them which are sent to thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered chicken under her wings, and ye would not behold? Your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth, till you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. The idea that a preacher is supposed to be nice I don't see it in Scripture. When Jesus was calling men hypocrites and 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 serpents and and devils, by definition, those were wholesome words. So there's that. 
But Dr. Ruttman's vitriol wasn't random either. He wasn't a guy who went around just running his mouth at everybody. He never directed, as far as I can find, he never directed his, his coarse language and his direct language to people who were trying to live for God. But it was rather, it was reserved for basically two classes of people. Either people who taught damnable heresies, like Islam or the Roman Catholic Church, or people who made a living trying to convince God's people that the book they had in their hand was full of errors. And I think I think it's a distinction with this loss on some people. I think he was they just think he just went around blasting everybody, and it's not true. It is a distinction that is lost on some people, but it is a distinction that is worth making. And if you just simply dismiss him as being mean, I think you're missing the point. Now I really want to go a lot more into some of Doc's uh, unique doctrines. Uh, although that could easily be its own two-hour thing. I mean, the guy preached for 67 years. He said a lot of things. Like I said before, he had plenty of time to say plenty of things, and he said a lot of things that maybe he shouldn't have. He talked plain, and he was derisive and even insulting of people that he felt like were hurt teaching things that hurt Jesus' bride. And I won't even dwell on some of the unusual doctrines that he has that I happen to agree with, because I do, I do agree with a lot of them. Um, but I'm just let me, let me just, so he wrote this book called uh, Black is Beautiful. And it's, it's quite a book. It's, uh, I don't know, 300 pages, I guess. And um, Black is Beautiful, he talks about how um, some of the medieval plagues in Europe were caused by UFOs. And he claims that the CIA has put dra- brain transmitters in children and old people and prisoners and black folks and whatever. He talks about Atlantis and the Bermuda Triangle and time warps and black holes and black government helicopters. And I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot in that book. Now... I will say this. I have my own cluster of theories that sort of, you know, fall outside the three by five card of allowable opinion, but it is probably not wise to write down things that you cannot prove as, as a regular party minister. You can have your theories and you can talk about your theories, but you got to be, you got to, you got to be careful with that sort of stuff because at the end of the day, you can't prove those things for the most part. Um, Rugman did seem to sort of delight in the obscure and the arcane and even the bizarre sometimes. And the problem with that approach, let me tell you something. I, I, I could, I could, I could take my, I could take my uh, podcast thingy here and I could cover topics that are way more compelling to people. I could talk about UFOs and Bigfoots and, 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 and all, all that. Stuff. I could cover it and put a Christian spin on it and get a pretty good size audience. I know I could. And I'm interested in some of those things. And so are you. But the problem is the Bible tells us to not really concern ourselves with profane things and with old wives' fables. So many a Christian has teetered at the edge of the rabbit hole. Dr. Ruckman went down that rabbit hole on a regular basis, and he took his audience with him. And some of that stuff's interesting, some of that stuff's compelling, some of that stuff has nothing to do with teaching the Bible. And Doc also predicted the rapture incorrectly more than once. And I'm not sure what else I can add to that. He he ought not have done such a thing. So that's problematic. That's complicated, right? His home life is complicated. The way he explained things was complicated sometimes. Uh, Some of the things he chose to focus on, complicated. It's all part of the picture uh, of what this man is and what he was all about. But I'm going to wind down here with talking about Doc's followers. So, the best way I know to explain this is as weird a character as he was, and he was, he engendered a lot of admiration and loyalty from people, some people, including myself. And somewhere around the late 80s, as far back as I can chase it, uh, the word Ruckmanite or Ruckmanism started to get, started to get tossed around. And it was tossed around as a pejorative by his critics. It was tossed around as an insult to people who went to his school or people who were fond of him or people who followed uh, some of the things he taught. Uh, it, it began to be applied to people who thought the Bible they had in their hand was without error. It has, it's been applied to me. And in so many cases like this, what was meant as an insult was claimed as a badge of honor uh, by mostly young, eager men uh, that made a hero out of a man who probably never wanted to be a hero. 
See, here's one of the things that I don't know. This is probably not a fair comparison, but I'm gonna make it anyway. So one of the th so Doc had a had a brilliant mind. He had a and we call him Doctor Ruckman for a reason. He has multiple degrees. He spoke several. He had all kind of talents and everything. And and when a guy has that going for him, it would be very easy for him to ingratiate himself with the intellectual class. There was a class of intel in Christian intellectuals that. That look down on common people. They look down on people that are foolish enough to believe that God gave them a Bible and preserved it. There are people out there that uh, teach that God's you know perfect, infallible, inspired word. When you try to nail them down about what that means, they ham and they haw and they talk about the originals and they talk about the all this stuff that has nothing to do with anything. And so, so that's that. Those people they, they tend to look down upon just simple folks that have a Bible that they believe. And there's a lot of disdain towards people, um, the, the intellectual side of Christianity, to the to just the common people side of Christianity. And Dr. Ruckman could have easily uh, sided with the intellectuals. He had the he had the credentials for it, he had the educational credentials for it, he had the intellectual credentials for it. But instead, he he chose to be identified with common. You know, North Carolina mountain hillbillies and 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 just common, ordinary folk, and a lot of people. Um, okay, I, I I am recording this in February of 2024. In case you're, if in case you stumble across this a couple of years from now, and right now Donald J. Trump is running for office, and I'm not a huge Trump fan, but I will say this: one of the appeals of Donald J. Trump. You, you can look at him and say, man, this guy's got all these problems, and he does. And he's got all these weird things, and he does. And there's plenty to dislike about Donald J. Trump. But one of the things that the the elite and the establishment in this country don't understand, it took me a while to understand it myself, is that the appeal of Donald J. Trump is not that he is this great moral bastion, because he's not. And, and, and the appeal of Donald Trump is not that he's this great intellectual, because he's not. The appeal of Donald Trump is that the same people that hate me hate him. And if I may draw a parallel that maybe doesn't stand up under too much scrutiny, the same people that have disdain for me had disdain for Dr. Ruckman. And so, that's part of his appeal. And so they began to take people that that agree with Doc on whatever, and they began to call them a name. They began to call them Ruckman. It's been called been calling them Ruckman. They called this entire body of work Ruckmanism. And I don't think. Okay, you need to understand this. I, I talked to Doc, uh, you know, a handful of times. Every chance I got, I was around the guy. But that's not a ton of times. There are people that are listening to this that knew him way better and way closer than I did. Uh, but I will say, in my conversations with the man himself, I don't think Doc ever wanted Ruckmanism or Ruckmanite to be a thing. I mean, he understood that it was used as a pejorative and it was used as a shorthand, uh, as an insult against the people who he considered his friends. And to that extent, he, you know, it, it drew the lines of demarcation and lets you know who was on whatever, who was on this side, who was on that side. But I don't think he ever wanted his name attached to a thing. I just, I don't usually say, well, he's arrogant, whatever. I don't think he wanted, I don't think he wanted people to, to wear his name as a badge of honor. But there it is. It wasn't his idea. It just sort of happened. And also in my experience, the last thing he wanted anybody to do was to waste time defending him. And yet they did. Here we are, 10 years, I think he died in 2015. Here we are almost 10 years after his death, and there are a group of his admirers who, frankly, are absolutely insufferable chumps who are known for their lack of charity, who are known for their, their, their intellectual vapidness. And there are people on the internet, particularly since the internet is now a thing, they there 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 are people who who they just roam the internet 
slandering Ruckman, and and when they do that, Ruckmanites roam the internet responding and getting in these silly, stupid arguments. Do you understand that debate is, listen, the book of Romans as a work of the flesh? Listen, if you're the only guy that's doing that, I understand, I understand. Man, the... Doc Ruggman was still alive, and somebody contacted me and wanted me to be part of a video project where they're going around getting all this testimony of all these people that have been positively impacted by this man as a way to shut up his critics. And the guy said, I really want to defend the old man. And I said, don't let the old man find out you're wasting your time making videos about how great he is. Okay. So like I said... As his critics roam the internet slandering him, Ruckmanites respond and get in these little these little contests where they 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 say dumb things and waste time while the world dies and goes to hell. Okay, I will give you an example. So uh, there's an article out there that I, I that uh, had talked about how Ruckman had in in the writer's opinion he had disqualified himself from the pastorate. And I went through some of those same reasons that I think the guy has a pretty good point. Um, so, so the guy, so, 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 a critic of Ruckman wrote an article about how Ruckman was disqualified from the ministry, and somebody should have sat him down and said, "Hey, you need to, you can keep doing all the stuff you're doing, but you can't be pastor." Okay. So that was the article. So the the Ruckmanite responds in the comment section and says, "Listen, dummy." No pastor meets all the requirements of 1 Timothy 3. If you can find me a better man than Dr. Ruppman to follow, I would like to meet him. Otherwise, shut your trap and listen. You might learn something. See you in the funny papers. I mean, that's not an argument. That's, that's, that, is, that is a waste of time. And in my opinion, not something the old man would have had much patience for. And these guys, they, they write this stuff that, that spend their days defending a dead man. They want to sound like tough guys, but honestly... I've met some tough guys. I think I am one. And it just doesn't, it, it, it sounds like somebody trying to sound like a tough guy, but they're not. And what you do is you come across as a thick-headed buffoon blasting everything in sight. I'm your friend, man, whether you think it or not. And if me point, if, if you're doing that and me point it out and makes you mad, I'm not that hard to find. My name is Michael S. Alford. I live in Woodbine, Georgia. I'm in the phone book. Give me a call. I was at a meeting one time. I was at a meeting one time and um, a street preacher meeting. And you would think that street preachers, this is not my notes. Um, you would think that street preachers had a thicker hide than your average, you know, average whatever. But sometimes they don't. So my dear friend, Dr. Gerald Sutek, current missionary of the Philippines, this is before he went to the Philippines, he was at that meeting and he was talking about it and they had a bunch of guys from Doc's, church, uh, Doc's school and Doc was still alive then. And had a bunch of guys from, from PBI that were there. And you understand, Sutek was the assistant pastor at that church for a while. I mean, he knows, he's got Ruckman stories that'll curl your hair. I mean, he's, he's known the man for 50 years, right? And so he tells these guys, he's tasked with charging and, and, and sharpening these young fellows, including myself, so we can go out there and preach on the streets in Memphis and, 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 and get the gospel out and do what we came to do, right? So he tells these men that you cannot ride Ruckman's spiritual coattails. You need to get your own stuff, your own, your own stuff. And don't hide behind his accomplishments and his spirituality. You need to get your own stuff. And you do that by going into battle and facing the, you know, go out there and touch the elephant, as they say. Well, these guys got mad. And they packed up their toys and they went home. A guy like that is never going to do nothing for God. My point in all this is defend the Bible don't defend him. Now, I really struggle with how to explain this next part, and I, I hopefully I do a good job. So Ruckman's admirers uh, will sometimes take the view <clears throat> that Doc is the last word on any, any given subject. That if God didn't show it to Ruckman, 
then it must not be true. And they might not say it that way out loud, but over the course of several, it feels like several hundred conversations, I don't know how many it actually has been, but let's just say several, let's say scores of conversations over the years, it is definitely a thing I've noticed. In fact, I knew a man whose habit was, when he was quote-unquote preaching, is he would read a text, and then he would immediately, unapologetically, open up one of Dr. Rotman's commentaries on that text, and read what Dr. Rotman said to the crowd. I mean, come on, guys. Read the Bible for yourself. Do you understand that the body of Christ is a body? And as that body matures and grows and, and becomes more fulfilled, that we ought to know more, we ought to have more light. I mean, the Holy Spirit of God has been teaching men the Bible for 2,000 years. We ought to know more than they knew in 40 A.D. Or else, what's the Holy Spirit been doing all these years? And so what you have uh, when you go sit down to study your Bible is you have the accumulated wisdom of 2,000 years of men studying the Bible and asking God to show them something. Okay, so as, as God reveals more and more and more and more down through the centuries, nobody has found the bottom of that book yet. So, so, so every man that you have that you've learned something from, uh, be it Brother Rockman, be it whoever, what you should do is take the things that man teaches that are true, and you should use them as the foundation for what God can and will show you. Because God ought to be able to take you further than he took that guy. Because you have the foundation of what God showed that guy. And I dare say that what Dr. Ruttman wanted was for people to take what he had learned and use it to go to the next level and say, okay, God, you showed us this now. You showed your church this. What are you going to show your church next? And finally... It's a weird habit among his admirers. Some of them seem obsessed, and that is the right word to use, obsessed, with Ruckman getting credit, air quotes, credit, for the things he taught. that are also taught by others. I've absorbed some teachings from Brother Ruckman that I don't even remember that's where I learned them from. And I turn it and I know where the verse is, and I've looked at it, and i thought about it, and I've, it's, it's proven itself to be true to me, and so I'll pass that information on to someone else, and I don't remember where I got it from because it's this big glob in my head. And so there were people who, especially on the internet, like I said, these guys are great keyboard warriors. But they will find someone teaching, for example, kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven being two different kingdoms. That's not uh, exclusive to Doc, but it he, he was a big part of that that being put out, and they'll they, and so a guy will put that out, and they will run to that guy on the internet and say, oh, you got that from Ruckman. You need to give credit where Ruckman taught you that. Ruckman taught the man that taught you, and we want to make sure Ruckman gets credit for Ruckman's doctrine. And it's a weird thing to worry about. Okay, so, so, so whoa, 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 okay, let, let me let, let, walk over here. So, so, if God, according to the Bible, if God shows a man truth from the Bible. He does it not just for that man. He does it for the edification of the entire body of Christ. Okay? The men that preach, that preaching does not belong to them. That preaching belongs to the church. A man who teaches the truth, that truth does not belong to him. That, that truth belongs to the body of Christ. It is community property, and nobody should be worried about getting credit. So... Calm down, Francis. So as, as I think I've made clear, maybe none of this is clear, I don't know. As I think I've made clear, Peter Ruckman is at best a, a mixed bag. He has been, to me, a tremendous blessing, but that blessing was not without its trade-offs. On one hand, he was a sincere man who wanted to see people get saved, and he wanted to save people to learn the Bible. On the other hand, he was... Kind of a kook. Uh, on, on one hand, he has produced, uh, through his ministry, a sizable group of dependable men who have ministries all over the world. And on the other hand, he's produced this little subculture of basement-dwelling fake tough guys. 
And both of these groups, and every point in between, they are both part of his legacy. The man is a little bit of an enigma. So the question, and I think it's a fair question to ask, is with a guy like Doc, do you throw the baby out with the bathwater? I mean, he taught some great things. And if you could get those teachings without some of the color commentary, would that be worth it? You know, my friend David Brown, we were talking about this subject many years ago. David probably doesn't even remember. I don't. I know David doesn't listen, and uh, he probably does not remember this conversation. But you go through Doc's books, and Doc will lay. You know, Doc will list ten or twelve or fifteen intellectual that are you know that are that are that are that are that are not worth the whose books are not worth the paper they're printed on. And he'll call them names. Of, and 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 David Brown said, uh, you know, I'm glad to know that those guys were wrong. I mean, it's helpful to know, but all those guys are dead now. And what good does that do me? So if you can take the things that Doc taught that are true, and if you could get those without all the baggage, isn't that something you'd want to do? So would I take a baby Christian and introduce them to the works, to the tapes, to the books, to the preaching videos of Dr. Peter S. Ruckman. I think I would. I certainly know I have. But I would preface it with the same sort of admonition that Alex gave to me all those many years ago. Quote, some of you guys won't be able to handle this. So there you go, the complicated legacy of Peter S. Ruckman. This is Michael. This has been the Street Preacher's Corner Podcast. Thank you for listening. Um, Thank you. I do not take it lightly. I'm going to close this thing out. Thanks for stopping by, and I will see you on the other side.